good afternoon, everybody, and um, thanks for attending my presentation. Thanks for uh, having the conference and for um, having a chance to share what I have been doing in the last three years um, at the Center for Development Research in Bonn. Um, I'm based in there as a, as a PhD student, and I've been working with colleagues there, Joachim von Braun, with uh, big support. And uh, in both countries, I had local support without which uh, I couldn't present the, the findings I'm presenting today. Um, it's an attempt to do a synthesis of two chapters um, of my thesis, and I haven't done that before, so bear with me if I, um, yeah, maybe the consistency can be improved. But I, what I will try to share um, is, and I will start with a brief outline of the trend of large-scale land acquisitions in the last six, seven years. Um, we'll then say how I conceptualized the phenomenon and how I went about the analysis, and then I will come into the case studies I picked. Um, it's a case study approach, so there is limitations for generalization, but I still think there's some findings which, which might hold true um, for other settings. Uh, we can discuss it afterwards, and I'm happy to see that there's more research coming um, because there is need. Obviously, I, I leave a lot of blanks. Um, very, it's difficult to get data on these land acquisitions. One attempt was done by the land matrix, who use media reported deals and cross check them in country with partners. Those are the numbers they have produced. Um, they are like a week old. Um, they update them continuously. You can go on the web page, even if you know a new case, you can, you can tell them. Um, I have doubts about the total reliability because there's media bias and everything, but it's a nice approximation. These are the investing countries. So you see uh, Europe is there. Uh, America has quite a lot of deals, but Asia is a big investor, and South Africa um, also from Latin America, we have a number of investments. Those are the recipient countries where the investments are targeted. Um, we see that East Africa is very prominent, West Africa as well, and Southeast Asia, Laos and Cambodia receive a lot of uh, attention. This has partly to do with how uh, vividly governments also promote these investments and what is uh, the situation of land availability. Um, what is the situation? Well, there's a number of risks. Land grabbing is often labeled, so if legitimate users lose their right to land, uh, be it the private farmland or the communal land around the village, is a big threat. The unsustainable resource use is another threat, uh, not to be underestimated, exploitation of labor. But there's also opportunities. It might generate additional uh, employment opportunities, which then reduce poverty. Market access, uh, access might improve as well as infrastructure. So the question arises, can they serve as an engine for growth, and can this growth be inclusive? What do I mean by inclusive? And we can discuss on that. I mean, I'm, I insert Eric Torbeck's, uh, as a because he mentioned it this morning. So I, I consider if it's pro-poor, so the poorest part of the population is gaining at least proportionally uh, to others, and so inequality is not raising. It's a very simple definition. Um, I, I see those impacts not happening directly, but through a number of channels. I identify five main channels for my research. There might be others. In the two settings I was working, those, uh, I think, are the most important ones. Here we go. Three of them I consider as the factors of production. So land, maybe not surprising, as, uh, as the main transmitting channel, uh, labor, um, and natural resources. So the values of these factors might change. Land might become more valuable or less. Transferability of land might change, and who gets access. Um, similarly, for labor, uh, there might be more jobs, uh, but who has access to them and what is the wage level? Natural resources, I, I think, is important to underline that smallholders and rural population, they're not only farming and business people, but a lot of them are also foresters in a sense. So they use forest products to complement their income in the dry season. And so the natural resources surrounding these communities are important, and I will show how that is uh, the case for the Ethiopian case. Technology could be a, a big impact. Um, Martin was telling yesterday at the opening that that is one of the ways to overcome um, poverty traps is, is technology and knowledge about tech, new technology. This could spread through an investment, potentially. They could introduce new crops, new, product, new ways of producing, and also organization of production. So this is, um, if we think an institutional economic part, that is the kind of where the contracting and the organization of production might change. And then there is the institutional level and the market level. So property rights could be affected, violated, and the property right regime might change. So customary systems might be challenged and, uh, because the center might enforce 
the legal system in an area where before it wasn't enforced. So there might be for the local setting kind of distinct uh, change. How do I go about it? So what I'm trying to do is impact evaluation. And the biggest problem is attribution. I mean, the, the world doesn't stand still while these investments happen. There's other things happening. And some of the change you will only see after a certain amount of time. Um, broadly, there's two type of uh, impact evaluations you could do. One is the counterfactual based impact evaluation, which is very rigorous. You have a, a counterfactual, and then you can see how, what is uh, the treatment effect, and you can measure effect. I'm not able to do that in my cases. Um, there was no good date line, data for the Ugandan case, and in the Ethiopian case, it's an early stage, so it's too early to say anything about the impact. The, the data I collected could be used as a baseline in, in three, four, five years to do some measurements, but um, so what did I do? I combine an ex post and an ex, ex ante analysis to, um, to share, um, to look at the both case studies. So one case, the Uganda case, uh, or oh, the Ethiopian case is an early stage investment. Ethiopian was promoting these investment activities uh, since 2008, and uh, the, there was a big um, number of investments coming in, and the case I looked at also started. And I used the, the survey data I, I collected in 2010, 2011 as a baseline to calibrate a model which then shows some potential future evolution of the project. The other case, Uganda, is an old uh, investment. It has changed in the, the ownership, but the, the roots go back to early colonial, uh, post-colonial times in the late 60s. And there, I also was there in 2011 to get my data. So I could use the observation from then and try to understand how we reach that situation. So it's a more analytical narrative approach, um, institutional economic-like. And today, I will try to combine those two. Um, data sources, so I used a lot of qualitative uh, sources to get myself acquainted with the situation in both settings. I spent significant time in both uh, uh, country contexts. I mean, that's what a young researcher is good for. He, 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 he doesn't have the big support, but he has time so he can go there and sit and talk with the farmers. And that helped a lot. I understood much better what the situation was. But I was also able to do a survey um, not very big, 140 households in Ethiopia and 170 in Uganda, but still it tells something about the local population. Um, and uh, yeah, I will show some of that. Um, this is the Uganda case. We are located in the eastern part of Uganda, um, close to Kenya. Um, this is the main road going to, to the port uh, and to the coast, so quite a lot of traffic. Uh, there's markets and shops around the road. Um, it's one of the poorer areas in Uganda. And you see here those green areas are wetlands, and the red area is the investment. The investment uh, has a history. It started as a Chinese rice development scheme. Um, after 20 years, the Chinese left, and the government took over and was operating as a state farm. Um, and then it was privatized, and now it's operated under Indian UK private company. The other case, uh, Uganda, uh, Ethiopia, is located in the very far western corner of Ethiopia, Gambela region. It's a lowland part of Ethiopia bordering southern Sudan. Um, it's quite remote, so in that sense it's quite different from the Uganda case, and it's not very densely populated. It's only a few people per square kilometer. Uh, and um, there's two distinct ethnic groups. In the Uganda case, it's much more mixed. Um, there's a, a number of settlements. Those dots are the local villages. And uh, I, I did surveys in all these villages. Um, the investment is planned to be 10,000 hectares. This is the size of the investment. And there's a, a lake where they use for irrigation. Both investments are producing rice. So I have a, a similar crop to compare. And in the simulation, I will show the results of later. I basically assumed an area of 100,000 hectare being the affected area. So I used proximity as a kind of, as to define the local context which I'm interested in. I'm, I'm looking at the local implications. And then I, I run some simulation where I take away 10,000 hectare out of these 100,000 and, and see how the situation changed. But um, I come to that in a minute. This is uh, the situation today in eastern Uganda. Uh, it's the, the, the rice producing part of Uganda for, for lowland rice. Um, 
and let's see, how did we get there? So I identified four drivers that led to the conversion of wetlands. So today all the wetland is converted into rice fields. Situation you know from, from Asia, for Africa it's not yet that popular. Um, a first driver was after the Chinese started and some people had worked there, they acquired the skills and spent after, um, after, after work some time to, to uh, plant on their plots. A second driver was the restructuring of these commercial farms. So when the, when the Chinese left and the, the state government took over, a large share of the worker were laid off, two-thirds of the worker. And they left, so they lost their um, main source of employment and they started using their skills, rice, to produce a cash crop. Um, and the same thing happened again in the 90s. So the, the organizational change was actually a big technology push, um, which was not planned, but it happened. In addition, there's two other drivers, population increase and, uh, and relative price change. Um, source of knowledge. So I was asking the today's rice farmers, so where do you know, uh, where, did, where did you learn from how to cultivate rice? Um, and parents and neighbors are the most important source. And if we look at the history, even initially neighbors were important, but the, the parents are becoming more and more important. It's a small, small sample, but it shows some of the representative, um, some of the shares. The other, so the work at the investment side also matters. And especially if I asked people, so you learned it from your uncle, but where did your uncle get it from? Often the uncle used to be a foreman at the, at the farm or, and teach them. So the spread from the, the knowledge spread is something we can see. Um, land values, um, I, I mentioned already there's a vivid rental market now in Uganda. So all the wetland is converted, but farmers who don't have land can rent land from neighbors. And they change the plots very often on seasonal basis. Um, and I was interested to find information, okay, how did that, how did that change uh, in the past and when was actually the point that all the land was converted? And it was difficult to get good data on these, uh, on these issues, but I did some recall questions. And the, 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 what is happening today is actually that they pay 120 US dollar per acre per season. So that's quite an quite a amount uh, the local users pay on the, on the rental market. That tells something about the profitability of growing rice in that area and the importance for the livelihood. Um, actually much more than the investor pays. This is the situation in Ethiopia. At the top you see the construction work going on on this large-scale farm, and here you see the test field, um, and which might be a situation in a couple of years if they manage to, to really operate 10,000 hectares. The model I did, and that model is always a kind of an approximation, I basically considered those two groups which are quite distinct along a number of, of uh, features, and I have another paper on that. I'm not going into detail. Each of the group has seven livelihood activities, so a mixed livelihood approach, and for each of the activities, they have, each of the activities uh, creates an, an, an output which are then priced in, in monetary terms and requires a set of inputs. And the, uh, the, the, and then I can say, okay, as the, as the, as the investment evolves, uh, those might change. The, the shadow prices of the inputs might change. And uh, there's two constraints in the area, which I motivate from observation and from literature. There's a, a market constraint. The area is very isolated at the beginning. But as the investment arrives, um, more demand for local produced services will, uh, will uh, increase. And there's a labor market constraint. It's a very remote part in, in, in Ethiopia. There's little. Uh, labor rental between the farmers and there's no other jobs than the civil service uh, with a few jobs and one, one hospital. Um, I do, well I did a bit more scenarios but what I present now is, is three scenarios. The, the, so a base run which shows the mix of these activities for each of the groups. Then I take away 10,000 hectares of forest savanna land and, and see what is the impact on the local population's overall uh, income and, and per capita terms. Um, then a second scenario is the evolution of the big investment to 10,000 hectare size. That is the plan, and the investor is very, uh, very ambitious to following up and then putting a lot of money there. Um, so he might succeed. It's a question when it will be profitable, but um, they are trying to get it done. 
Um, and then I did an alternative scenario, which is an kind of a utopian inclusive policy measure. So if the uh, Ethiopian government would de decide to have only given away half the area to a foreign investor, but uh, invest also in, uh, in smallholder productivity. So increase some extension service, um, a little bit more infrastructure. Um, so basically lower the, the isolation and increase the productivity of smallholders, which at the moment is, is quite low compared to what can be reached in this area. Um, and those are the results um, of these simulations. Um, so you see the indigenous group on the left and the, the settler group on the, on the other side. And those groups, um, okay, what do I distinguish here? The indigenous are, is an ilotic tribe group that lived in the area for more than a century. Um, and the settler group is also a group which I consider local, which have been moved there by the former regime um, in the 80s. So they, but they are using different uh, technologies. For example, one is uh, the, the settler group is using ox plowing agriculture, while the indigenous group is mostly relying on, uh, on manual agriculture. So this dotted line is the per capita income. Um, for both groups, and we see that the investment has the potential to lift people out of poverty, yeah, on, on, on average for both groups. However, the gains of the settler group are even higher. Um, I will show that in the next table. And we see a, a kind of structural change that employment, off-farm employment is increasing. Um, not so surprising. I'm running out of time, so I have to be quick. Those are the relative changes of each of the activities, and you see agriculture activity goes down, so does hunting and gathering, so the, the, in relative importance, in absolute importance, it remains an important contribution, and uh, employment is the biggest push uh, for total income, and incomes go up by 50% uh, if the investment really evolves to this mega size with a lot of, um, lot of jobs created. What happens to shadow prices? That's one of the nice features of doing the simulation that you can say, okay, what are the constraining inputs and what happens to their uh, appreciation of, uh, by the local population? And we see that, uh, so one finding is that farmland per se is not scarce in that area. It's the labor invested in the land, which is the limiting factor. People could convert more of the savanna land into fields, but they just don't have big enough families to do so. And Shadow price for labor goes up as, as other opportunities arrive. Um, and the shadow price for forest land remains relatively high with the indigenous group. And it is lower already in the beginning, but it even falls uh, by 50% for the, the settler group. And the settler group has a more kind of structural shift uh, compared to the indigenous group. Um, OK, to sum up. Um, the value for land might increase and might not. It did in the case of Uganda, where there is more population pressure and there's already high um, uh, intensity of use. In the uh, Ethiopian case, land per se is not scarce. Labor has the potential to increase income in both cases. Uh, the off-farm employment was a big part of the, of the simulation part in Ethiopia and also of the, of the stories in um, in Uganda. Natural resources remain important. Uh, in the Ethiopian case, if they lose 10% of the, of the forest land they were using, it causes a 4 to 5% loss of income for the indigenous group. So the, the, the impact is quite significant. It's compensated by off-farm employment, but it's still an important. And that is not considering general biodiversity gains of forest land. Um, Technology diffusion does happen, but not automatically. So in the Uganda case, the early phase is uh, to be said that the Chinese were also focusing on transmit technology. The big investor nowadays doesn't, and it mainly is triggered through shocks uh, when people were laid off. Uh, institutions, in both cases, the property right regimes were not violated when it comes to the private land, so the, the, the farmland people had, but the communal land was, was uh, taken away. Um, and you could see a change in the power balance. So the issue you made um, is an important one. What can I say regarding to the title of the paper? Um, it's a relative positive picture to growth. So the growth in both micro settings has been stimulated by the investment, mainly through the employment channel, but also um, um, through 
business activities of the uh, shops and everything. Um, inclusive, mixed. Um, and here it depends whether we go for the, um, what definition we, we take. Um, in both settings, it was the, the, the better off parts who could, could uh, gain better, who were earlier, um, like those who had access to wetland could gain into rice and everything. And, but also the landless had a chance to get, to get jobs. Um, the role of smallholders, in the Ethiopian case, I did the simulation and said it, it has similar poverty effects if you would focus on smallholders besides. In the Ugandan case, and I probably didn't mention that, the, the laying off also led to that people who had worked together in the brick factory or in other units, they formed farmer organizations. So there was actually transforming um, of, the, of the groups, and some of these groups are very innovative in the rice growing in the area. So the, the, the role of smallholders remains very important. Thanks for your attention and thanks to those who funded my research.